trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings unto the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful. It's great to be here today and uh, in this great conference, feel the power and the presence of the Lord we, the way we feel Him here. Great to see all of you so early in the, in the morning and a uh, nice crowd for this, this time of the morning and uh, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, I concur with uh, what Brother Anthony Mangan told us last night. Wasn't that outstanding last night? Just tremendous. Just tremendous. And we are, we're living in a very dark age. I know that we have, uh, back in, our, in the history of the world, what we call the Dark Ages. But I don't believe we've ever lived in a darker age than which we live today. Uh, I noticed up here, Lord, give us America. And uh, why must we pray for America? Because there's accelerated moral decline, because 4,358 babies are killed in abortion clinics every day, because there's 3,219 divorces granted daily. The deviant lifestyles today are accepted as the norm. Pornography, drugs, racism, and abuses are common, and America certainly needs the Lord Jesus Christ today, right now. Uh, we're living in an age that's dominated by the prince of the power of darkness. And the scripture says that men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Uh, ours is a generation that has become a cesspool of sin. If one thing we could do, if we could go home from this conference recognizing and realizing the times in which we live, I think we would go home changed. If we would go home and recognize how close we're standing today to the soon coming of Jesus Christ in the clouds, I think we would go home and be different people, different preachers, different ministers, and we would reach for people differently and better than we ever have before. Uh, there has never been a generation that has had more artificial illumination but less true light. Uh, you and I have come to this conference today to let our light uh, get rekindled so we can go home and let our light shine. Uh, we have become known as the condom generation, but we are going to know the condemnation of God if we do not change America. Uh, our generation is a generation where the Bible is not welcome in the public schools, and yet condoms are. Our generation is a generation that would rather come out of the closet than clean up the closet. And we have got to have apostolic direction like we've never had in the history uh, of our movement. Uh, uh, we have seen uh, a brand new terminology come into America. Uh, God calls it drunkenness. We call it a social disease. God calls it sodomy, we call it gay rights, and an alternate lifestyle. God calls it perversion, we call it pornography, adult entertainment. Uh, God calls it immorality, and we call it the new morality. Sin has been made to appear less sinful than ever before. America has legislated at one time against those things that God has said were to be wrong. But gradually America began to tolerate, then began to accept, and then began to openly condone and even promote what was once unthinkable. Uh, it is because America just didn't care. 
But I believe that there is a church today that does care about America. I believe there are ministers of the gospel today that are hungry for a greater move of God than you've ever seen before. I know I stand before you today as a hungry preacher, hungering to see greater revival than I've ever seen before in my ministry of 25 years. We're living in a generation when we have seen the word of God come to pass, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee unto the land which he swore unto thy fathers to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not and houses full of good things which thou fillest not and wells digged which thou diggest not vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not when thou shalt have eaten and be full then beware lest thou forget the Lord that has happened in the United States of America, and uh, sadly to say, it has happened even among some of the ministry of the United Pentecostal Church. Uh, but I believe uh, that we are standing as a movement uh, on the greatest uh, day of revival that the world has ever known. I've not come today to teach woe or to prophesy doom, but I'm convinced uh, that if God tarries, the next few years are going to produce the greatest North American revival in our history. Revival is, I'm speaking of evangelism. We know that true revival is in reach. Evangelism is outreach. One thing we must do is reach out. I liked what Brother Gerald Mangan said to me on... Uh, uh, Monday night, uh, he was talking about uh, something and he said, I just do something even if I do it wrong. And I believe that it is time to be stirred to action. God honors effort uh, and God honors organized effort even more. One of the travesties of the church today is the maintenance mode syndrome. We get in a maintenance mode strictly endeavoring to maintain. But we've got to do more than maintain. We must evangelize North America if we're ever going to reach the world. I don't claim to be an expert. I don't claim to stand before you and have the answers uh, this morning. But I know that God has helped us in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, in the 13 years that we have been there. God has helped us to raise up a church, and for that we are very, very grateful. Uh, we have used bus ministry, and we have many families today. I was making a list of families just a few weeks ago that have come in through the bus ministry. There are tools that are at our disposal if we will use them. I know that many people say the bus ministry is a thing of the Past. I say to you, it is a thing of the present. It is a soul winning tool that will bless your church if you will commit yourself to evangelism. Amen. Brother Johnny Godare, uh, who is my district superintendent, averages 1,100 or more in Sunday school every Sunday morning. And they run 20 buses at least every Sunday morning. And that is a key to their growth. Home Bible studies uh, still builds churches. And one thing that we must do as ministers of the gospel, like begets like, and our people will follow our example. One thing we must never allow to happen is we expect the people to do it all. I understand, I know the value of leadership training, but people will follow a leader that has corn in his crib. People will follow a leader that knows where he's going and and if you're going to train people to teach a Bible study, we've got to get a Bible study chart under our arm and teach a Bible study as well. That is highly, highly important. There's all kinds of things. There's the telephone ministry. There's the letter and card ministry. One thing we have used is the NOVA team, which NOVA stands, it's an acronym, stands for Newcomers Outreach Visitation Alliance. Uh, and uh, it is a follow-up program. Uh, prison ministry, Spanish ministry. One thing 
that we have got to concentrate on today is planting churches like we've never planted churches. I would say that every pastor here today, except maybe the home missions pastor that is still struggling to get a toehold in your city, I would say that every one of us can be vital and instrumental in planting a church. There is an area, there is a need somewhere that you and I can fill. Just a few Sunday mornings ago, uh, it was this year, uh, we dedicated nine children in a dedication service. Uh, three of those babies were from our Spanish-speaking congregation. Uh, I couldn't help but let tears come to my eyes uh, as I looked uh, and I saw those three mothers uh, cradling those babies in their arms. Uh, and I thought uh, that if we had not had the burden and had people that would reach out to the Spanish-speaking constituency of our community, then we wouldn't be dedicating those babies and those babies would not be living and going to be raised in a united Pentecostal church home. They have church uh, on Friday nights. Uh, they have church on, or they have Sunday school on Sunday morning. At this time, they're joining us in the rest of the services because the man that was helping us has gone back to El Salvador, endeavoring to get his family out of the country. But we're continuing on. We're forging on in that. Uh, it is an important thing today for us to plant churches all over the United States and Canada. Preacher, if you can leave here today with a burden in your heart to plant a church. If you're an evangelist, let me talk to you for just a few moments this morning about starting a church somewhere. We have sometimes the mentality that I'm going to look for a church. You better be careful what you say. In my young ministry, I made the statement uh, very innocently that I didn't think I could plant a church. I didn't think I could, I could do that. And I was going to take a church that was established and let it grow. God must have heard me speak. Uh, and uh, he sent me to North Carolina. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade uh, that uh, experience uh, for anything in this world. What I'm preaching to you is we've got to get out of the mentality that whenever a church comes open, 20 or 25 people call and say it's the will of God. Hello? I know those churches have to have pastors. We're in the midst of a pastoral search right now for the church that God uh, has blessed us to pastor. But what I would say is we need men to stand up and say we have got to reach North America. I'm not looking to live on easy street, but I'm looking to do the will of God. That is paramount. That is imperative. And there's nothing like uh, walking into the place uh, where God has called you. There may not be a church there, but you're there. And if God called you, God is going to keep you. When God called you to that place, He did not fumble the ball. He did not make a mistake. Uh, in North Carolina alone, I don't know about across the United Pentecostal Church of North America, I, I do not know about that, uh, but in North Carolina alone, we have 50 counties that do not have a church that preaches the truth of this gospel. What I would say to you is we need men in the United Pentecostal Church to reach North America like we've never needed men. Darkness is shrouding the world and it is time for us to answer the call. You can plan a church we, we planted one in Ashboro, uh, North Carolina. My assistant went there uh, five and a half years ago. We were with them in their fifth anniversary services. Uh, and I now have a beautiful plaque hanging on my wall thanking us for our part in planting that church. We're presently planting a Spanish church. Uh, they're using our facilities right now. And uh, we're also in the process of planting a church 35 miles north of us in Mount Airy. Let me say this. Uh, there, there are some cities uh, that are large enough to have many, many churches. 
and uh, it is imp- it would be very important i feel like for us to put somebody there that has come out from underneath our ministry somebody we can work with somebody we can direct I know Brother Jesse Williams. In fact, I saw Brother Crumpler. I think, is Brother Crumpler in the building? Here he is right here. Brother Crumpler has been in Brother Jesse Williams' church for many, many years. But today, he pastors the Northside United Pentecostal Church in Fayetteville. Brother Williams sent him up there. Have you finished your building yet, Brother Crumpler? He's just finished building a new building. Brother Williams told me, he said, sometimes, he said, my people shout higher over Brother Crumpler's report than they do what's happening in the mother church. Uh, But he's excited about what is happening. Uh, My hat is off to Brother Jesse Williams uh, for taking Brother Crumpler and assisting him in starting that church right there in his own city. Brother Crumpler, I commend you. You are doing a great job. Uh, North America uh, has cities, metro cities, that are calling to us today. We have cities that are already approved for metro missionaries. New New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Kansas City, Vancouver. Others are going to be approved by district boards. Uh, There are souls that are crying out all over North America for you and I to come and reach them. There are people that are hungry today. I like what Brother Mangan said last night about the key to our revival is loving people. Loving people. That is so very, very important. Uh, uh, we just, just this past Sunday, baptized uh, a lady whose husband pastors a Trinitarian church in our city. Their daughter received the Holy Ghost and got baptized in our church back in September. My youngest boy, who's in high school, invited her to church. She said, Mother and Daddy, this is the church I want to go to. They decided to come and check it out after after their services were over. They've been coming late now on Wednesday nights when their services are over. I'm meeting with that pastor again this Saturday, and he's already told me, you're probably going to be baptizing me in Jesus' name. I've just got to get it set. Uh, America is ready for revival we've got to reach America before it is forever and eternally too late Jesus is coming the sun is setting on the western horizon of time you and I are the key why don't we stand and raise our hands and love the Lord could we is a product of two years of study and research. Approximately two years, two and a half years ago, I read a book by Dr. Elmer Towns on the characteristics of a growing church. When I was finished with the book, I felt that there was some of the uh, points in that book that applied to United Pentecostal churches, but I felt like there were a whole lot of the points in that particular book that did not apply to us at all. And so I began to research among our churches in my travels Uh, What makes a United Pentecostal Church grow, and what are the unique characteristics of growing United Pentecostal Churches? Now, in the last two years, I think it would be safe to say that I have been in more than a hundred of our United Pentecostal Churches, and I have uh, taken a notebook with me. I carry it in my briefcase everywhere I go, and I bring my list out every time I'm in a growing church, and I compare this list of characteristics with that particular church church that I'm visiting. I'm not finished with this list yet, uh, someday perhaps, but I've been compiling the characteristics of growing United Pentecostal churches. I want to know what is unique to every church that I visit, every growing church that I go to. I want to know what makes it a growing church. What are the characteristics that's in all growing churches? And so let me give you a 25-minute overview of a session that I have taught for hours in other districts. Number one, one, I have found out that all growing churches are worshiping churches. Without a doubt, every church that I have ever gone to that is experiencing growth and revival, there is an atmosphere of revival in that church. I have found that that church is a worshiping church. Worship is a very important part of building an uninhibited church. And an uninhibited church is a church that is very appealing to people who live in the 90s. Elmer Towns 
times in a recent ser- uh, seminar where there was approximately 200 Baptist preachers present, just a handful, maybe four or five of Pentecostal preachers. Elmer Towns made the statement of the baby boomer generation that we're trying to reach today. He said, there is one group of people on the face of the earth that are custom made to have growth in the 90s. And he said, that is the Pentecostals. He said, they are going to appeal to the baby boomers because of their freedom of worship. And he proceeded to tell that group of Baptist preachers that they need to uh, lock the door on their pipe organs. He said, you need to find yourself a piano. And then it stunned me when he said, find somebody in your church that can play that piano Pentecostal style. He said, it's that kind of worship that is appealing to the baby boomer today. One thing I consider to be a real sin, and that sin in all capital letters, is when an elder or leader or usher runs to the pastor's office before church and says, we have a family here today from such and such a denominal church. And that pastor and leader proceeds to tell the singers to tone it down, the choir to sing a slow one, the elders not to get too excited. Let's say, everybody take it easy because we got visitors here today. I want you to know, and I forgive me for putting it in a carnal term, but I want you to know the number one selling point of Pentecost is the freedom of worship that we have in our churches. People are leaving traditional denominal churches in mass. According to recent statistics, the United Methodist Church has reported a net loss of 600,000 members between 1980 and 1990 right here in the United States of America. 600,000 people they lost. The Presbyterian Church of the USA lost 1.2 million people between 1980 and 1990. They are losing members by the hundreds of thousands in the traditional churches. Baby boomers do not want to go to a church that's dead, dry, dull, and boring. They want to go to a church where people believe this thing, where people are not afraid to worship God, not ashamed to lift Him up. I remember our general conference a couple of years ago. We were having such a tremendous move of God. Many of you will remember uh, the gentleman that was invited there by Brother Urshan, uh, Mr. Vincent Sinens. He is a writer for the World Christian Encyclopedia. And Vincent Sinens got up in the pulpit wanting to say something nice about us. And he made the statement, I believe you, United Pentecostal Church people, love the name of Jesus more than anybody on the face of the earth. Well, when he said that, if you'll remember, the conference just went... Went nuts. I mean, they went wild. They shouted. They run. They jumped. They screamed. They hollered. They worshipped. He didn't know what he had said. He stood there and just lost it for a little bit. And uh, when it finally all settled down several minutes later, he started into his little speech again. And so he began with his first statement. I believe you United Pentecostal Church people love the name of Jesus more than anybody on the face of the earth. And before he could say another word, there it went again. They run. They jumped. They shouted. From where I was sitting and looking across that audience. It looked like just waves of the glory of God coming down one balcony across the floor like a pendulum going up the other side and then swinging back across again uh, as we worship the Lord. Brother Teclamarian in that particular conference, everyone was talking about how he just run and run and run and run and he had run till he couldn't run anymore and sit down on the edge of the platform and, and fan himself with a handkerchief and as soon as he got his breath up he'd go running again, worship in God. After that service that night, I went back to the hotel and I got on the uh, elevator. A young couple was already on there. Brother G.A. Mangan hollered, hold the elevator. And he come across the lobby to get on the elevator. Now this couple that was standing on the elevator, they looked like Barbie and Ken. Everything was perfect. Their clothes matched each other. They didn't just match what they had on. They matched each other. Uh, her tie matched, or his tie matched her dress. Her shoes matched his suit. I mean the These people were perfect. Every hair in place. Everything was right. Brother Mangan got on the elevator. On the other hand,
around, his necktie cocked sideways, his neck shirt was open, his hair was messed up, he had perspired. He had been right down there in the middle of all that worship. Now, either Barbie and Ken didn't know who he was, or they were dumber than a sled track, because they proceeded to talk and said, boy, wasn't that a bunch of foolishness tonight? Haven't we matured beyond that yet? Didn't they know there were politicians there tonight, and religious leaders from other denominations, and they begin to talk about how they were embarrassed at that type of worship. Oh, Brother Mangan just leaning on the wall, not saying a word. And then it came to his floor. He got off the elevator and turned around and put his arm back inside the door. And he said, God shut Michael's womb for making fun of David worshiping God. He said, you show me a church that doesn't worship and I'll show you a church that don't have babies. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me hurry along. I took five minutes on point one. There's 11 of them. Number two. (laughs) All growing churches are praying churches. Everybody said praying churches. Everybody said praying churches. According to Reader's Digest, the average American only prays 30 seconds a day. The average preacher in America only prays two minutes a day. That's not hardly enough time to bless your food. I want you to know if we're going to reach America like Brother Foster challenged us to a moment ago, we're going to have to know how to bring down strongholds through the power of prayer. Can you say amen? Ian Bounds said, prayer is not preparation for the battle, but prayer is the battle. Everybody said, prayer is the battle. I believe in computers. I like things fast. I am a real baby boomer. If I get up in the morning and decide I'd like to have something, I'll generally have it before the day's over. I am a real live baby boomer. But there's one thing that you can't hurry up. There's one thing that there is no shortcut. There is no replacement for, and that is good old-fashioned prayer. I found out that all growing churches are praying churches. We put up a banner in our church about two years ago. It's about ten foot square, covers the back wall, and it has the word PUSH on it. And the word PUSH is an acronym for pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. I pray to God that that spirit will get a hold of us again. That we can get out of our complacency. We can get out of this business as usual attitude and get down to the business of touching God until something happens in our church, in our ministry, in our city. Can you say amen? Number three, I have found that all growing churches have a visionary pastor. All growing churches have a pastor who is a dreamer. There are several words that are synonyms. Vision, purpose, dream, goal. Whatever words you want to use, there needs to be a dreamer in every church. There needs to be a visionary in every church. Pastor, you must know the purpose of the church. You must have goals for your church. Proverbs 29 and 18 said, Where there is no vision or where there is no dream, the people are going to perish. Pastor, you need to know what God has called you there to do. As Brother Mangan challenged us last night, know that you're called of God. And then when you're sure of that call of God, know what He's called you there to do. God doesn't call failures. God doesn't call losers. If God called you to a city, don't you worry about whether you've got enough education or not, or whether you have the pulpit polemics necessary or not. What you need to concern yourself with is that God called me here. And if God called me to this city, He called me here to build a church. And I have everything that I need to build that church in this city. Where do you want to be a year from now, five years from now? Set goals for yourself. I present to you that nothing significant has ever happened in any arena of life, whether it be political, financial, spiritual, whatever area it is, uh, the sports world. Nothing significant has ever been accomplished that what somebody didn't dream about it before it before it ever happened. There has to be a dreamer at the helm. Before there was ever an electric light, there was a Thomas Edison who was 
was a dreamer. Before there was ever a telephone, there was an Alexander Graham Bell. Before there was ever a free nation called the United States of America, there was a George Washington. Before there was a nation where blacks and whites could sit down together as equals, there was a dreamer called Abraham Lincoln. Everything significant that has ever happened, somebody dreamed about it before it happened. And I found out that pastors of growing churches are men who have dreams. They're dreaming about great things in God. I saw a little cartoon, Charlie Brown. Forgive me if you don't like cartoons, but Charlie Brown is standing uh, in the first frame of the cartoon with a bow and arrow in hand. He lets loose of the arrow and it shoots into the wood fence. Whenever he does that, he drops the bow, runs up to the fence and draws a circle around the arrow. Big Mouth Lucy comes along and says, Charlie Brown, what are you doing? And he said, when you do it this way, you never miss. Do you know when somebody wanders into your church on a Sunday night, nobody invited them, no ministry of your church was involved in having them there, they come to an altar, repent, get baptized, get the Holy Ghost, and without effort you have a convert. You go to the district conference and you say, oh, superintendent, I had a guy get the Holy Ghost Sunday night. Let me get up and tell the conference about it. You know what you're wanting to do? You're wanting to draw a circle around an arrow that happenstancely hit the fence that you didn't have nothing to do with it. Hello? God, help us to set goals for ourselves. Help us to become visionaries and dreamers. Help us to make plans today that's going to result in growth tomorrow. Help us to put seed in the ground. Too many of us are sitting back and waiting on something to happen. Instead of planning something to happen. Number four, all growing churches have a high level of membership involvement. Every growing church that I've ever visited has this as a very common element, and that is they have involved their members in ministry. The most important statistic in your church and mine is not how many we have in Sunday school on Sunday. The most important statistic is not how many we have on Sunday night. It's not even how many we have in Bible study. The most important statistic in your church or mine is how many members do we have involved in ministry. It has been said that 80% of the work in most United Pentecostal churches is done by 20% of the people. I challenge you today to involve more leaders, more members in ministry in your church because the more you expand the base, the greater the greater the results you're going to experience in church growth. If I was to bring a table out here two or three foot square and a wheelbarrow full of sand and start shoveling sand on top of that table there is a point that that table the base of that table could not hold any more sand it would come right up to a peak and then every shovel full of sand I put on a shovel full of sand would roll off the sides because the base can only hold so much you can't ever go any higher but until you have broadened the base bring another table in slide it up against that you can't just double the height, you can triple the height just by broadening the base. And so it is when you broaden the number of members in ministry in your church, when you get everybody involved in the growth of your church, it is so important that all of us uh, allow our people the opportunity of involvement. We have preachers, and I'm guilty of it myself, that stand in the pulpit and we talk about everybody ought to be involved, everybody ought to have a ministry, everybody ought to be doing something and and invariably some saint of God will make their way to us after service and with tears they'll say, Pastor, I'd really like to do something for God. Find me a job. And we pat them on the shoulder and say, We're going to find you a job. You get back with me. I'm going to think of something for you to do. And we never develop the job for them. We never present the opportunity. You ought not to preach involvement unless you're also going to create opportunities for involvement. Amen. I put a committee together in our church and I told them I want a list of 225 jobs. I want you to find 225 different jobs that people can do around our church. And uh, I did that because I felt like that's about how many adults we had at that time. Adults and young people. And I intended to preach hard that everybody needed to be involved in the success of the church. But I did not want to do that without also having an opportunity for involvement. So that if anybody 
somebody came to me and said, I'm ready to respond to what you preach. I wanted to be able to give them a list and say, here, you choose a job that fits you and let's go to work in the kingdom of God. We hang those 11th hour laborers over hell. Every preacher in here has done it. Those guys that were idle in the marketplace at the 11th hour. The Bible said that the good master said, why stand ye here idle in the marketplace? And that's where we quit reading. You ought to go on and read the next verse because the verse has their answer. Their answer was because no man hath hired us. Hello? It's not the responsibility of the church to find a job. It's the responsibility of you as a pastor to find people opportunities for involvement. And the more people you involve, the greater your church is going to grow. Number five, all growing churches maintain enthusiasm. All growing churches maintain enthusiasm. I have found that a great program can die for lack of enthusiasm, while a rather mediocre program can be a great success if you keep the enthusiasm high. We've got a lot of pastors in the United Pentecostal Church that come Easter time, they want to put on a promotion, and I like that. I think we ought to introduce everybody to our churches that we can, anything to get them in the doors and introduce them to Pentecostal worship and Pentecostal preaching. We heard the testimony last night of the girl that was one to the Lord by coming to a Messiah. However you can get them here, I believe we ought to do that. But a lot of times we'll put on a program for Easter. Some preachers pay hundreds, even thousands of dollars in order to put together an Easter promotion and it doesn't bring the results they want. There are other preachers in the United Pentecostal Church, Brother Cole, I was thinking of Brother Green Kitchen when I thought of this this morning, a pastor in West Virginia, pastored there for many years, a very, very simple approach to church growth. About four or five weeks before Easter, he gets up and says, everybody on that side's on the silver team, everybody on that side's on the gold team, you're the captain of the gold team, you're the captain of the silver team, and then they begin their Sunday promotion. Promotion, Easter Sunday promotion, and it is a very mediocre, a very simple promotion that they use year after year for many years now. And every service, they get people in the pulpit, and they get all excited, and they keep momentum high. They keep the excitement and enthusiasm high over that very simple program, silver and gold. And every year, they do better than they did the year before for their Easter Sunday promotion. I think over 1,500, if I uh, remember correctly, this last Easter on their Easter Sunday promotion. And so maintain enthusiasm. Every church has four classes of people who affect the enthusiasm or momentum of the church. I heard John Maxwell talk about this. And let me repeat what he said. I think it bears repeating. He said in every church, number one, there are momentum takers. Everybody said momentum takers. These are the people that will destroy any program they get involved in. They don't have any faith. Well, if they do have faith, it's faith that something bad's going to happen. It's faith that it's never going to work. It's faith that this program's defeated before it ever gets started. They're momentum takers. And then in every church there are momentum shakers. They don't stop the train, but they're pretty good at slowing it down by questioning and voicing their unbelief. They shake momentum. Then number three, there are momentum fakers. They're the people that's always talking but never doing. Hello? And then there are momentum makers. There are those people that just believe that we're going to succeed. We're going to build a church. We're going to grow. The bus ministry is going to work. The home Bible studies are going to work. God's going to bless this revival. They're momentum makers. When you talk to them, every word that comes out of their mouth is exciting. I found out that all growing church maintain a high level of enthusiasm. Number six in your notes. All growing churches have an aggressive plan of evangelism. Now, I don't believe that the type of evangelism you choose is nearly as important as the level of commitment that you make to whatever you use to win the lost. If we had Morel Cornwell here today, he'd stand in his pulpit and he'd preach Bible studies to you with great conviction. He would go as far as telling you that if you're not teaching a Bible study, you're going to split hell wide open. There ain't no way you're going to go to heaven if you don't teach Bible studies. And he believes that. If we had Wayne Mitchell here today from Moline, Illinois, he'd stand up here and squeal and scream and say it's Sunday school Sunday school invest in children it's the only way to build a church now is one right and one wrong no they're committed to what they believe will win the lost Somebody said, Brother Cunningham, we got a one-week Bible study, a two-week Bible study, a four-week Bible study, a ten-week Bible study, a twelve-week Bible study. What is the best Bible study? The one you're using. 
Hello? The one you're using every week is the best Bible study. The worst ones, the ones that don't work, are the ones that's sitting on the shelf drawing dust. So there is an aggressive plan of evangelism. I don't have time to talk to you about uh, in-reach versus outreach, but I would caution you in your churches, let's don't build our churches so full of in-reach that we have cut the throat of outreach. I do a little exercise in some of our church growth seminars where I ask our pastors to divide a page in half. On one side of the page, list every program, project, ministry, department, everything that's involved in their church, and then beside that, on the other side, I want them to write down the word seeking or saving. Is it evangelism or is it discipleship? I have found out that in almost every seminar that we've conducted in the last year since we've been doing this exercise, that more than half of the churches, half of the pastors that are in our seminars are doing more than 50 or 60 percent of what they're doing is involving, if you please, neither seeking or saving the lost. It is in reach. It is fellowship. It's patting people on the back, getting together, having fun, and absolutely ignoring the lost. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, this is my purpose. This is why that I'm here, to seek and to save that which was lost. And I present to you that the purpose, in fact, the only right we have to existence as an apostolic church today is seeking and saving the lost. Can you say amen? Amen. Brother Mangan mentioned last night in that powerful sermon. I believe that was a history-making sermon last night. He challenged us. He was bold, and I thank God for it. But he mentioned change last night. You'll notice what he was talking about when he said change. He wasn't talking about change in doctrine, change in standard. He was talking about change in concepts toward reaching the lost. That the doors are going to be open for lost people. Everybody said we're in the people business. Say it again. We're in the people business. That is the responsibility of the church, seeking and saving that which was lost. Number seven, all growing churches have a high level of faith in all they do. There is a a level of faith there for every program, every project, every ministry, every revival. They believe that God is going to do what He promised He would do. Let me hurry. Number eight, I found that all growing churches have a clearly defined belief system. They have clearly defined beliefs. All growing churches. They know what they believe and they know why they believe it. I don't have time to expand on this, but let me tell you that whenever uh, you pastor and when you preach to people in 1994, you're preaching to a generation that has a higher level of education than any generation the church has ever ministered to before. When my grandfather started the church in 1939, according to history and censuses at that time, the average level of education was the fourth grade education. Education in 1939. The average level of education in 1994 is between graduation from high school and a minimum of one year of some type of technical or junior college of some sort. That is the average. There are many college and university people that are coming into your churches. I want to tell you, you get up and preach the truth with all you've got. You get up and preach faith and power of God. But when it comes time to teach the standards, honey, in 1994, you better know what you believe and how you believe it. And you better be able to know how to open the book and tell people where and show them where it is in the book and show them what God's Word says about it. Say, so Brother Cunningham, what about that old thought that uh, I'm the preacher? You know, do it because I say do it. It ain't going to work in 1994. Hello? Better know what you preach. People want to follow somebody that knows what they believe. Can you say Amen. I read a little story on the airplane the other day. Bishop Fulton S. Sheen, a very prominent communicator back around the year 1900. In 1902, he was invited to the United States from England where uh, he was invited to the Philadelphia Town Hall to uh, speak at a very historic meeting there in 1902. He stayed at a hotel about two or three blocks from Philadelphia Town Hall. And whenever it was time to go in the morning to the Town Hall to give his uh, message or his sermon speech, whenever he was on his way, he said, I'll not ride in the carriage. 
marriage. He said, I want to walk the couple blocks. The little boy said, oh, you went the wrong direction. Turn around and go back that way about two or three blocks and you'll not miss it. And as he's walking away, the little boy hollered and said, hey, mister, what are you going to Philadelphia Town Hall for? Bishop Fulton King turned around with his Bible under his arm and said, I'm going to give a sermon this morning on how to go to heaven. He said, little boy, would you like to go with me? And the boy said, no, sir, you don't even know how to get to town hall. People want to follow somebody that knows where they're going. Can you say amen? Number nine, all growing churches are giving churches. Brother Tenney made a powerful statement a couple of years ago that I have never forgotten. He said there are some people that God cannot bless. He's bound by His Word. And there are others that God cannot refrain from blessing. Again, He is bound by His Word. Now you can... If you have rotten eggs in your pocket, throw them at me if you want. But this is my opinion, and I feel it strong. I do not believe it's the will of God for our churches not to support the ministries of the United Pentecostal Church. I believe everything that applies to our members. We stand in the pulpit and say, God cannot bless you if you don't give. I believe that applies to your church and mine. That didn't get a very good amen. Hello? I hear people, I've been a district director for the last 14 years, nine years involved in the youth division, the rest of the time involved in home mission division. And I've called pastors for years that gave zero. Zero to Mother's Memorial, zero to foreign missions, zero to youth, zero to ladies. Their church send in zero to home missions. And you call and say, hey, we're trying to get a good offering for the district as a district director. And I'd really like to see you give. Oh, Brother Cunningham, we can't, we can't. And every excuse they give is the same excuse their saints give to them. Only they don't accept it from the saints. Hello? Better hurry on here. Number ten. All growing churches put high priority on leadership training. All growing churches put a high priority on leadership training. Let me just give you some stats from a survey that was taken. 1992 survey, a question was asked, what occupies the majority of your ministerial time? This was of United Pentecostal Church pastors. The number one answer given was sermon preparation. Our pastors said they spend more time in sermon preparation than anything else. The number two answer was counseling. They, say they spend the second amount of their time in counseling. Number three was leadership training. That was the one, two, and three answer. And then I ask our computer, we got an intelligence quotient in this particular program that we use to do the surveys, and we ask the computer to combine the answers with those that have uh, various sized churches and tell us what is the average size church of these that answered the question like this. We found out that those that answered the question that the, what occupies the majority of your ministerial time was sermon preparation, those men pastor an average size church of 79. Those that answered counseling, they pastor an average size church of 105. But those that answered leadership training, they pastor an average size church of 157. I think the statistics makes the point. Number 11, and I'll close with this, and Brother Farino's coming in one minute. All growing churches educate themselves to understand American culture. Now, I just added this particular point just this week. I felt like something was missing. And the other night at our uh, minister's training session, Brother Billy Cole was addressing all of the ministers that were gathered here. And he began to talk about the importance of knowing the people that we're trying to reach. And as he made some statements, it began to click in my spirit that that's one of the missing ingredients from my list, is understanding American culture. You see, if a foreign missionary is appointed, uh, Brother Lehman, I see Brother Lehman just come in, if we appoint a foreign missionary, the foreign mission board is not going to be angry with him if he takes the first year or so on the field and learns the language and learns the culture. We have learned over many, many years of foreign mission service that it is important for that person to know the culture and the language and as much about the people as he can if he's going to reach those people. Yet in America, we don't make any effort at all at understanding the culture of the people we're trying to reach. And I believe that number 11 is that growing churches have learned American culture. They know how to relate to American people and to appeal to American people. Brother Billy Cole made this statement, and I close with this. Come, Brother Farino. I close with this. Brother Billy Cole said the other night, anytime you see a church experiencing great growth, that pastor does not necessarily have more power with God than you do. He has simply learned what makes Americans tick. 
And when he learns what makes Americans tick, then he can reach them. Let's stand and raise our hands and love the Lord, could we? And everybody say motivation. motivation. Have you been motivated? Amen. Has your motor been turned on? But it is also stated that motivation without direction is simply frustration. On your syllabus outline, and those that do not have it, you can make a note on uh, a separate piece of paper. Number one, the churches that are worshiping churches to assist and help you, if you'll stop by the home missions booth area located in the old sanctuary, we have a series of lessons there in my father's house. And on level two, uh, it's number uh, 11, lesson 11, mark this down, lesson 11, level two, my father's house, beautiful lesson on worshiping. Under the number two, all growing churches are praying churches. In my Father's House series, which is a total of 36 lessons, there's another lesson in level two dealing with the principles of prayer. Areas to assist you under topic three of the growing churches that there is vision marked down the church planter's dream. Everybody say the dream. Also marked down the making of a leader. These are items that later on, after today's sessions are over with, you can stop by and refer to these items. Down under number four, mark down so you want to serve. This is a tremendous book in assisting you as a pastor to help develop the lay ministry gifts in the church. Over under number six... Dealing with evangelism, mark down hows of evangelism. Item number six. Quickly, item number eight in the area of believing. We have several, several outlines and series of lessons dealing with the tremendous doctrine that we believe and hold dear. Organizing your church for growth. Being able to reach in and organize your church for growth will start with discipling those new converts. You have to get those people rooted and grounded. Just simply mark this down. Mark down Jack Cunningham and mark these three items down. New converts course. Number two, organizing for growth. Number three, book of farms. Number four, the pioneer church planner. If you enjoyed the session he just gave to you, you can find these four items that he has developed and put his heart into. Again, back in the old sanctuary, stop by home missions booth area, and I believe that God is already at work in the land. He's touching your heart. If you want to develop yourself individually as a tremendous leader, we have resource materials for you. We Bible symbols, symbolic objects, the rainbow, a symbol of God's covenant, a stairway, a symbol of the way to God, thunder, lightning, clouds, and smoke, symbols of God's majesty, thunder, a symbol of God's voice. 
trumpets, a symbol of God speaking. The pillar of cloud and fire, a symbol of guidance. A throne, a symbol of God's glory. Dry bones, a symbol of spiritual death. White hair, a symbol of wisdom. The wind, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Fire, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Stars and lampstands, symbols of God's ministers. A signet ring, a symbol of authority. Arrows, symbols of God's judgments. A scepter, a symbol of God's rule. The capstone, a symbol of preeminence. A rock, a symbol of stability. The human body, a symbol of interdependence. Grass, a symbol of human frailty. Symbolic creatures, the serpent, a symbol of Satan's subtlety. Locus, a symbol of God's judgment. Beast. Symbols of earthly kingdoms. A dove, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. A lamb, a symbol of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. Symbolic actions, breaking a jar, a symbol of the destruction of Jerusalem. The cursing of a fig tree, a symbol of judgment. Washing hands, a symbol of innocence. Being thirsty, a symbol of spiritual need. Baptism, used for salvation and a symbol of cleansing. The Lord's Supper, a symbol of union with Christ. Anointing, a symbol of empowering by God's Spirit. Harvesting, a symbol of Judgment Day. Tearing garments, a symbol of anger and sorrow. Spitting, a symbol of contempt. Shaking off dust, a symbol of rejection. Sitting in sackcloth and ashes, a symbol of repentance. Lifting of hands, a symbol of prayer. Covering the head, a symbol of submission. Symbols expressing God's nature and character, God's face, a symbol of His presence. God's armor hand, a symbol of His power. God's eye, a symbol of His awareness. God's ear, a symbol of God's listening. God bless you. Thanks for watching.